Today is truly an exciting day uh, here at the Upper Room Bible Church because we are going to baptize some people and then we're going to celebrate communion together as a church. But before we do, I want to spend a few moments and we're going to have a, a barbecue and lunch and um, the cook said, what time are you going to be done? And I assured him, we will be done in time. And, um, but I want to spend a little time talking about the two ordinances of the church so we can just lay some groundwork, just make sure there's no confusion. And I want you to know that I have met, there's going to be six people getting baptized today. And I met with each one. We talked about what it means to get baptized and, and the priority of, of knowing Christ as your personal Savior before you get baptized and what baptism means and what it does not mean. And so we've already covered that groundwork, but I just want to talk about uh, baptism and communion they are called the two ordinances of the church. An ordinance, according to Webster, is defined as an authoritative decree. And who was the authority behind these decrees? Well, obviously, Jesus Christ. It's his church. And let's look at that together. If you have your Bibles, we're going to look at a few verses. Turn to Matthew 28. Matthew chapter 28. There's a famous... Uh, portion of scripture that we understand the responsibility of the church and, and the priority of the church, really. Jesus, he was getting ready to depart, and he makes uh, this statement. I don't want to read, I'll give you a second to get there in your Bibles, but he said this, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? Because it's an authoritative statement. Um, an ordinance is an order, authoritative decree. And so Jesus said, hey, all authority has been given to me. And he goes on, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so Christ, Christ's church is to, number one, they are to go, right? You have to leave this building. You have to go. And uh, if we're going to fulfill this great commission. And second thing he tells us to do is to make disciples. Uh, Christ's church, a Bible church, is in the business of making disciples. It's good having you back. You made it home safe, and I was praying for you as you were on that mission, and thank you for serving our veterans as you did. But uh, we are to make disciples, we are to baptize them, and we are to teach them. Teach them what? Well, verse 20 tells us, it says, to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And these last words are awesome, in this great commission, the ego imai, it's emphatic. Jesus is saying, listen, go and make disciples, baptize, and I myself, I'm with you. I'm going with you. Go and make disciples. Go baptize. Go teach the word. I myself will be with you every step of the way. Billy, are you paying attention? All right, good. I love shocking people. Did you know Jesus is going with you to Oaxaca? Amen? Amen. You're not going by yourself. And uh, we're excited about what he wants to do. He is going to accomplish his will. His church is going to be built here in Palm Desert and there in Oaxaca, Mexico. And also, did you notice the phrase, to the end of the age? The age refers to the time period when the church can make disciples, when the church can baptize, and the church can preach. In Matthew 13, uh, we see the same phrase, the end, of the end of the age, and it refers to his second coming. And so there's coming a day when we can no longer, as a church, make disciples. That day is coming. We can no longer baptize or teach new believers. And so that's why it's an authoritative mandate. Time is short. Communion is also an ordinance. Uh, turn to Luke 22. I want you to see what uh, was said about communion. Luke 22, starting in verse 14. 
This is the institution of the Lord's Supper, what we call communion. It says this, and when the hour came, he reclined at the table. They didn't have any chairs like we have. And the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He was going to the cross. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, there's coming someday soon a great banquet in the sky that we're going to be a part of. Amen? And that gets us excited. I can hear the silverware rattling already as the tables are being set. And we're going to be there with our uh, failures and everything, that are, all the mistakes we've made in life. But we have a wonderful Savior who presented us spotless before the Lord. And that's good news. And he says this, For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup, communion, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, what did he say? This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And now I would have you turn to Second, First Corinthians 11. Turn there, if you would. This is Paul. He's kind of recreating the story. And starting in verse 23, he's going to tell what he received from the Lord concerning the upper room communion experience. And he says this in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And notice what he said. He said this, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And did you notice, did you catch this authoritative command? Do this in remembrance of me. Do it. In verse 25, do this in remembrance of me. Verse 26, for as often as as you do this, how often? Often. Do it often. He didn't tell us to do it every week. He didn't say to do it once a month. He says, you figure it out. Whatever you want to do it. But do it often, regular basis. And as you eat this bread and drink this cup, he says, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Today, when you take the Lord's cup at communion, I want you to shout out and say, he died for me. He died for me. This, this is his blood. This is it. Or how about when you take the bread, you can say, thank you, Lord, thank you. You were bruised, you were smitten, stricken by God just for me so that I can have abundant life. And I thank you and I praise you. And he says, you're proclaiming my death until I come back. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, that's just kind of a little intro there. The Lord's Supper, we're going to have communion at lunchtime today, and Elder Dan is going to lead that, and we're excited about that. So don't go home. You have to stay for the barbecue, all right? The first thing he gives us is instructions in 1 Corinthians 11. He says this in verse 23. He says, he says, I received it from the Lord. I also delivered it to you. It's a mandate. We just talked about that. It's an ordinance straight uh, from the Lord. And there's this great picture that's involved here with the Lord's Supper, with communion. As you take it today, it's obvious. He's already told us what the picture is. But communion is a time of thankfulness and joy. Matthew wrote how after communion, they sang a song because it was a happy time and they were joyous. Look what God did for us. Look what our Savior, Jesus Christ, did for us. 
verse 24 of 1 Corinthians 11, after he broke the bread, he tells, he tells them very clearly what this is. He says, this is my body, which is for you. So the bread, what was it? It was a picture of his body. It was broken. I remember I grew up in a Plymouth Brethren church when I was a, a little guy, and um, they used one big loaf, and some of you don't believe I was ever little, huh? Is that what it was? But um, I was skinny back then too, all right? But they served, they didn't do these little cracker things. Nobody, nobody came up with that. I wish I would have, have, have invented that. I could have you know, made some money on it maybe. Just kidding. But they used these big loaves of bread, and they passed these loaves around, and you actually tore a piece of bread off the loaf. And it was, it was a picture of Christ's body being broken, being torn. And it was certainly very symbolic. And I, I missed that effect, but it is nice having that little, little uh, cracker, a little cup. In, in verse 25, he picked up the cup, and he said this. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. In communion, it's a picture of the death and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on our behalf. The cup is a picture of this new covenant. Praise God for that. Hebrews 8. It tells us about the old covenant versus the new covenant. And the old covenant, these, these Old Testament sacrifices, they were just a shadow of good things that were going to come. And what was that good thing that was coming? It was a new covenant, of course. Jesus Christ. It's where Jesus Christ would offer one sacrifice for all time. Good, you're learning. I like that. When, I, we, when we make a statement like that, I've got to hear some amens, all right? And uh, Hebrews 8 tells us that that single offering, get this, according to Hebrews 10, 14, it says this, it perfected us for all time. I look at some of you and I think, they are perfected? And you look at me and say, that pastor is perfected? It's true. Maybe you don't feel it and maybe you don't act like it. But before a holy, righteous God, you are perfect. Not because of what you've done. Not because of how many people you led to the Lord. Not because how much money you gave. You're perfect because of Jesus Christ. And so when we take communion, it's a reminder of that. And our hearts break, and yet we rejoice. And we go, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I'm so thankful for what you've done. In Hebrews 10, 14, a couple verses later, he, he gives us this amazing, amazing statement. Listen to this. Listen. God said this. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Now there's, you may have some friends, you may have some family that will remember your sins and lawless deeds, but God says, because of my son, I will remember them no more. As far as the east is from the west, they're gone. I buried them in the deepest sea. And I put a sign up, no fishing. Also, there's a preparation in verses 27 to 30. I want to read this. And this is important. Not too many churches tell about this. But, but notice it. You don't have your Bible? That's okay. I'll read it to you. Right after he gives us all this great information, he says this, Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now that is a serious statement. It really is. And... Um, don't take communion in an unworthy manner. And you say, well, what does that mean? I'm not worthy. Christ made me worthy. And that's exactly the point here. If you've never experienced the gospel, if you don't know Christ, if you've never experienced that 
forgiveness where your sins are washed away. They're white as snow. His blood ran red so that I was made white. If you've never experienced that, then today as it's being passed around the table, just say, you know what, not, not today, I'm, I'm okay. Pass on it. Pass on it. If you've never received that forgiveness, then you would be taking it in an unworthy manner. Why? Because it's a picture of what? It's the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And why would we want to pretend like we understand that? And that was for me when I have never accepted it. So he says, don't do it. Another unworthy manner might be if a person was involved in a continual sin. And, I'm, and some people I've heard over the years, they go, well, I can't take communion because I said a bad word to uh, somebody at work two weeks ago. Listen, that's not what he's talking about here. Make it right. Confess it before the sun goes down. But if you're involved in a continual sin that you refuse to give up, let the tray pass. Let it pass. It says this, verse 28, let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. God certainly knows we're not perfect. That's why we needed a Savior. And he provided one. And so before communion today, we always, we pause, and we take a, a moment, some time for people, for all of us to examine ourselves, to do some house cleaning, and then we eat and drink of Christ, and we experience his forgiveness afresh. And that's another purpose of communion. Do it often. Remember me. Remember what I did. Come to that labor that's filled with my blood. Restore that fellowship that we have. You don't need to get saved again. You just need to wash your feet. Get your feet washed. Well, the practice of this is we do it one Sunday a month, uh, communion doesn't save us. We understand that. It doesn't wash away sins. Again, it's a picture where we remember that what Christ did for us on the cross. And we use grape juice. Some churches use wine. And we use individual cups. Some uh, pass one big cup around. And, and you always hope that you're the first one that takes the first drink, especially during cold or flu season. Um, I was in Russia. I shouldn't tell this story. This is terrible. But I was in Russia a few years ago, and we were ministering in a, church, a large church. And um, they were having communion that day, especially for us. And they had, they had one cup, and this church went way back. And, I mean, people, and I'm going, okay. You know, and it was uh, a lot of runny noses, a lot of stuff going on. And so... Um, as soon as, what's <laughs> and so anyway, I, uh, as soon as he started wiping the cup, I like jumped up and was first in line. All right, I'll take communion. I don't want to be, and anyway, forget it. It was bad. <laughs> but today we use individual cups and, um, maybe a little more sanitary, but I have done the one cup method and, um, it's all good. In Acts chapter two. There's another little story for us about baptism. It's the story um, where Peter was preaching to some Jewish men, and the Bible tells us that they were cut to the heart. They were cut to the heart. They were convicted, and they wanted to get saved. And so they asked Peter this, what shall we do? And of course, what did Peter say? He says, well, repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized. That's the order. First, you come to a knowledge, saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and then you get baptized. And what is the baptism for? It's a picture of you giving your life to Jesus Christ. That's what it is. In Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, he got saved uh, by Philip explaining uh, the prophecy of Christ from Isaiah 53. And as they were going along in the chariot, all of a sudden the eunuch looked out and he saw some water and he said, hey, what would hinder us from, getting bap from you baptizing me right now? Nothing. Stop the chariot. And they went, it says they both went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Well, baptism, it's a picture. Again, the picture is of the death, the burial, 
in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And many of you already know this, but don't have a calloused heart. Remember back to the time when you were baptized. Remember back to the time when you were saved and you experienced the gospel afresh. When we baptize somebody, we usually say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. And then we say, buried with him in his death. And we go down into the water. Jesus, he he died on the cross. He went down. He went into the tomb, right? Buried with him in his death. And then we say, and then risen with him in new life. It's a picture, picture of the gospel. It's also a public statement concerning your faith. They are identifying themselves with Christ and his gospel. And this is, I really want to hit this. This is an exciting day for all of us at the Upper Room Bible Church for, on many different levels. Number one is I would say we are fulfilling the great commission for this church that Jesus Christ said. He said, go, make disciples, baptize them, teach them. We are fulfilling the great commission. Uh, we are being obedient as a church. We love making disciples. We love baptizing folks. We love teaching God's word. But also, this is an exciting day for us as individuals as well. We have been to the cross, haven't we? We've experienced it. We have eaten the bread of his body. We've done that. We have drank the cup of his blood and death. We have entered the water of baptism. We've done that. We reenacted what our Savior did for us. We know his forgiveness. We've experienced it. And so Jesus says, he says this, as often as you do this, do what? Do it in remembrance of me. Anna, when you get baptized today, and not yet, but when you get baptized today, you're going to think, I remember the day I got saved. Remember, you were sitting right over there, and the tears were flowing, and I said, is there somebody here, anyone here? Today's the day of salvation. And boom, she got up, and you came. And um, no prodding necessary. The Holy Spirit spoke to you in a powerful way, and the gospel has changed your life. It's changed your family. And um, so when you get baptized today, it's a picture. You're buried with them with his death, and you're risen with them in new life. How exciting is that? It's exciting for all of us because all of us remember that day when we did that, right? And so you can shout hallelujah, amen. Go, sister, go, we're excited for you. Let today be an emotional day for you. Take some time remembering when you were saved and when you were baptized. Remember the day when your sins were wiped away. Father, we thank you for the two ordinances of the church that you gave us. And you've told us very clearly that, that the purpose of this is it's a reenactment of what you've done for us. And, and, and we are to do this and we are to do it in remembrance of you. And so, Lord, today I just pray that everyone here in this building, if they know you as their personal savior, I pray that, that they would take some time and just remember what you've done for them. Remember that great, exciting day in their life when they gave their life to Jesus Christ, your son, and they received forgiveness of sins. And you, as the almighty God, said this to each one of us, I will remember your sins and lawless deeds no more. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now, I pray that you would just be with us as we go into the waters of baptism. May it be a joyous time and a time of just a a refreshed commitment for each one that steps into that water. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.